So, um, okay. So, uh, this is the weak gravity conjecture in its um, original minimal version. The conjecture concerns um, a theory of gravity and electromagnetism with couplings written in this section. And the precise claim is that there must exist a charged particle in the spectrum of the theory whose charge mass ratio is bigger than that of the extremal black holes. Uh, and, and this lower bound I will often uh, write as mu x, uh, which is an order one constant determined by the effective field theory. Um, and for simplicity, uh, such a particle with mass more than charge, uh, I will often refer to as a uh, weak gravity particle. Uh, note that we are considering effective field theories in four dimensions here. And in a, in a general dimension, we just need to adjust the powers of M Planck here and there. So uh, such a minimal version was later on strengthened uh, as we heard from uh, the previous talk to the tower version. Uh, the bolder claim is that uh, <coughs> uh, the theory uh, needs to be supplemented not just with one such particle, but in fact with an infinite tower of uh, uh, weak gravity particles. And the mass scale of the tower should sit at the M plan times the electric coupling G. <coughs> um, and even more strongly, uh, the sublapse version further claims that the tower uh, in fact should fill up a certain sublattice of the full charge lattice. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> could you click on the slide please? Oh, thanks, yeah. <coughs> Um, so the tower uh, really becomes infinite as we crank down the gauge coupling G down to zero. And it is precisely at this weak gauge coupling regime that uh, uh, the, the conjecture becomes more interesting and useful because um, a new physics effect would then be suggested at low energy, the tower itself. So um, we will mainly be interested for this reason partly in the a weak gauge coupling regime of the parameter space. So this is the menu. Um, we've just had the soup with some mixed flavors here. Uh, next, for the appetizer, um, I'll provide some preliminary evidence for the weak gravity conjecture by considering the hydraulic string on a torus. The EFTs obtained this way are constrained by so many supercharges. Um, even so, this will serve as uh, the first non-trivial evidence for the conjecture. Then for the ante, uh, we will switch to a more complicated corner of string theory, the so-called F theory, uh, for which we will verify the conjecture in uh, six and four dimensions in turn. The EFTs preserve eight and four real supercharges respectively. So the evidence from this main course will be much stronger than the appetizer. Uh, in fact, along the way, we will have also addressed some other conjectures. And if we have time for dessert, uh, I'll, I will comment on this um, uh, to finish the meal. So let's get started with the uh, first evidence unless there are questions so far. Okay. <clears throat> So this is a one slide upshot of the prelim evidence. Um, the hydraulic string theory is a, a theory of a closed string. It reduces at very low energies to 10 dimensional supergravity coupled to uh, 10 D super young mill with the gauge group SO32 or EA times E8. And to be specific, I will be assuming this talk, uh, the gauge group to be SO32. Naively, such a 10D EFT alone does not serve as a meaningful testing ground for the weak gravity conjecture, uh, simply because the theory does not have any massive states. Um, on the other hand, the hydraulic string um, also produces a tower of massive excitations, and we know how to quantize the hydraulic string on a flat space such as R10 or R4 times T6, the six torus, which is a direct product of six circles. <coughs> The idea is then to check if some of those massive excitations serve as weak gravity particles. And this way, the weak gravity conjecture will be tested. <clears throat> so 
Um, some details. As I said, the low energy effective field theory is 10 dimensional supergravity coupled to uh, 10D super young mills with SO32 gauge group. And we will be focusing on the 16 Catan U ones. The effective action uh, in its Einstein frame takes this form where we have the dilaton coupling to the gauge fields in this exponential fashion with the, with the coupling factor of one over two. Then the extremal charge mass ratio denoted by mu x, which will serve as the weak gravity lower bound um, is given this formula in terms of the space-time dimension D and the dilatonic coupling alpha. And uh, uh, this mu x is computed as one. <clears throat> now, by quantizing the hydraulic string, the max trap, we can obtain the mass spectrum uh, um, of the uh, head of the excitations in terms of the mass level n and the 16 dimensional charge vector q. Um, and this charge vector q takes these values uh, uh, in this form where c is um, either zero or one and the 16 integers qi's um, um, should sum up to an even number. <clears throat> Then the question is, if we can find states in the spectrum um, obeying this inequality. <clears throat> and uh, indeed, for any charge vector Q, um, okay, so then, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, sorry for this. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess it's better. Oh, <clears throat> oh. Yeah, maybe that's better. Yeah, thanks. Uh, if you could click once more. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so for any charge vector, uh, we can take the minimum mass uh, with the mass level n equals zero, uh, for which the charge mass ratio turns out to obey this criterion. One caveat here is that the gauge group is SO32, um, and we are checking this criterion for the Cartagena ones. Um, so what's been confirmed here is a, a sort of non-abelian generalization of the weak gravity conjecture. But, yeah, thanks. But we can simply reduce the theory on a six torus uh, with small generic Wilson lines turned on uh, to make it abelian in four dimensions. And because the internal space is a flat torus, all the 10 dimensional 16 supercharges are preserved under the reduction. So we end up with a four dimensional and cost four supergravity. Um, and in view of the weak gravity conjecture, it is crucial to observe that the extremal charge mass ratio is stable under the circle reduction. Uh, this was observed by Heidenreich, Reese, and Rudelius. So uh, even though the uh, space-time dimension D and the platonic coupling alpha uh, change individually, uh, they cancel in this combination, uh, which leads to the new extremum. So, the charge mass ratio is really invariant, it turns out. And therefore, the 10 dimensional weak gravity particles in the charge fab lattice, uh, with respect to the Catania ones, lead to four dimensional weak gravity particles, which verifies the sub lattice weak gravity conjecture in the four dimensional EFTs. What is alpha? Oh, alpha is the, the, sorry, alpha is the dilatonic coupling, sorry. Um, yeah, I thought I had, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, this, yeah, this is alpha, one over two here. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> good. Now uh, uh, we can be more serious and move to the stronger evidence in F theory, firstly in six dimensions. F theory is another name for type 2B string theory with seven brains, which source a non trivial dilaton profile along the internal space. So, six dimensional F theory is the 10 dimensional 2B string theory compactified on an um, internal four manifold, which is curved due to the presence of the seven brains. And it turns out to preserve eight real supercharges. Uh, so this is half of the previous number of supercharges. Here, the seven brains carry gauge algebras and, and charge particles arise from the open string, ending on them with a fixed charge factor known as the Champaton factor. So it may look impossible to fulfill the sub lattice weak gravity conjecture because the charge factor of this string is fixed. Then the day is saved by another ingredient of F theory, the three brain. 
But your three-dimensional brain can wrap an internal two-dimensional cycle to effectively produce a string in the low energy EFT. Uh, such a string can be associated with an, uh, uh, an every two cycle uh, uh, in the internal geometry, but it turns out that uh, a special two cycle can be identified so that the resulting string is the heterotic string. And we know a lot about it. In particular, uh, its excitations are characterized by the partition function or even its index burden, which we can control very well, even though the internal space is not flat. Then at weak gauge coupling, um, we can say much more because the heterotic string is also weakly coupled as it turns out. So its mass spectrum can be reliably computed and we can explicitly check if the excitations, at least some of them are weak gravity particles or not. And that's how things will go. Okay, let's get to the details. Uh, as already stated, we will be considering type 2B string theory on a internal four dimensional manifold X4 uh, in presence of seven brains that wrap around some internal two dimensional cycle uh, S2. Um, so from the perspective of the EFT, uh, these brains fill the entire six dimensional uh, space time and give rise to the gauge fields propagating there. On the other hand, from the internal point of view, they source a non-trivial dilaton profile. And this is formally described by endowing the internal space X4 with a certain mathematical structure known as an elliptic vibration. Um, in this talk, however, we won't care too much about, actually we won't talk at all about this vibration structure and we'll uh, only analyze the uh, internal geometry of X4 itself. Uh, specifically, we'll be looking into the physics encoded by the so-called Keller moduli of X4. Uh, they govern the internal cycle volumes and in turn, the gravitational and the gauge couplings uh, in this manner. So here the Vs are the cycle volumes measured with respect to the, the length of the type 2B string. And therefore, the couplings are divided by appropriate powers of M2B. We will be focusing on the uh, weak gauge coupling uh, in the regime in the parameter space with uh, the gravity fixed. So we don't want to lose gravity. Uh, so geometrically, this amounts to taking the volume of the S2 to infinity while keeping the volume of the X4 fixed. And uh, it follows that uh, in this limit, uh, there should arise some two dimensional cycle that shrinks. Um, and I will call it C2. So this should be intuitively clear if you imagine um, stretching one side of the rectangle while keeping the area of it fixed. So that's sort of the intuition you can have geometrically. So this is what I've just said about the geometry of weak gauge coupling. Uh, it turns out that we can say much more about uh, this shrinking cycle C2. A, it is the unique shrinking cycle. B, it is topologically a two-sphere S2, uh, not S2 here, but two-sphere. And C, it is a fiber, uh, uh, which roughly means that the, 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 the internal space X4 is essentially uh, represented as a two-dimensional uh, par uh, uh, parameter of a family of uh, these two spheres. <clears throat> um, so as for the physics of such a two-cycle C2, uh, we will be considering the three brain wrapped on C2, which leads to, as I said, an effective string in six dimensions. And these latter two properties of C2 uh, uh, turn out to imply that this string is in fact the critical heterotic string. Furthermore, it is a light string because the string tension is proportional to the volume of the wrapped two cycle, which shrinks in this limit. Therefore, we learn that a light tower of states uh, should arise as string excitation modes. Um, and interestingly, this first property of C2 guarantees that uh, this critical string uh, is in fact unique as a lightest string, uh, leading to the uniqueness of a graviton in particular. Now, we'd like to see if a part of this excitation modes will form 
uh, a tower of weak gravity particles desirably filling up a certain charge stop lattice. Um, so to this end, we first need to figure out the extremal charge to mass ratio. And therefore it is necessary to clarify the effective action in this limit. Um, <clears throat> the 60 effective action in such a weak gauge coupling limit uh, turns out to uh, 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 asymptote to a dilatonic einstein maxwell theory with dilatonic coupling alpha equals one, where alpha is this exponential coupling. So this is the result of the computation. Then the extremal charge to mass ratio oops, is computed by this formula to be one. So let's now take a closer look at the string acceptations. Because this heterotic string is a weakly coupled light string, the mass spectrum uh, of the uh, uh, excitation modes uh, is given this formula where n is the uh, uh, mass level. And what we care here is uh, uh, how large the charge Q could grow at a given mass level n. After all, for a given mass level, uh, uh, the maximal U1 charge Q max would tell us if uh, the, uh, well, the theory can have a weak gravity particle with that mass because this is the maximal U1 charge for that mass. Um, the task is therefore uh, to understand for which mass levels um, this inequality is satisfied and to test if the associated Q maxes fill a charge, charge sub lattice. So for this purpose, we just need to uh, uh, understand the Q max as a function of the mass level n, i.e. we need to know the upper bound for the charge for a given mass level. Such information is naturally uh, captured by the partition function of the six dimensional heterotic string, which is the generating function for the excitation degeneracies. And uh, for a given mass level n, uh, we just need to see the, well, extract the maximal U1 charge Q for which this degeneracy is non-zero. So that's the Q max. Uh, then we have this crucial observation. It turns out that a general property of the partition function known as the quasi-modularity uh, guarantees that the excitation degeneracies are non-zero for all the charges up to Q max uh, equals to two RK for the mass level of the form RK square. Here R is an integer which we can read off from uh, counting the number of intersections of the two cycles C2 and S2 inside X4. They are two dimensional cycles inside four dimensional space. So they meet at points. So uh, we have uh, distinguished a, a special charge sublattice of sublattice index 2R as in here, filled by physical states. Uh, then the uh, final step is to check if these sublattice particles uh, indeed uh, become weak gravity particles. And uh, the result is that it is indeed the case, which I will now explain. <clears throat> so once again, the uh, maximal charge Q max for the mass level of the form RK square uh, fill in this charge sublattice to RK and this in terms of the mass level is expressible as square root of four R N. And obviously this is bigger than four R times N minus one. And I'm making this shift because the excitation mass square is proportional to the N minus one. Then by also using this a connection between geometry and physics, we can derive easily uh, this inequality for all the charges of lattice particles, all part, for, for all K. Uh, here, this inequality is only marginally satisfied for large charges or large mass levels because it essentially boils down to n versus n minus one up here. Um, then the crucial remaining question is uh, to check if this prefactor in the lower bound, which I'll call mu string, uh, agrees with the mu extremum, which is one. And as you'd expect, they turn out to agree these two mu values, one computed from the internal geometry of X4 and the other computed from the asymptotic effective action. Um, let me emphasize that this is actually an, a model independent result. So 
This means that the summarized weak gravity conjecture has been verified for every six dimensional EFT of F theory. And this is remarkable because there are a plethora of such EFTs, over billions of them. And we have just verified the conjecture for all of them at once. So this is pretty powerful. Okay, having had this success in 60 F theory, uh, we now naturally proceed to four dimensional EFTs. So four dimensional F theory model is again, the 10 dimensional uh, 2B string theory compactified on an internal six manifold now. It turns out to preserve four real supercharges. Then just like in 60 F theory, once again, a special internal two cycle can be identified so that the three brain wrapping it produces an effective hydraulic string. With the supersymmetry halved, however, its partition function is much less controlled than in the 60 case, uh, but we still have some control. Technically, the hydraulic partition functions in 60 and 4 df theory are respectively uh, quasi-modular and quasi-Jacobi. They are just names, I won't explain what they are, but in any case, uh, the ladder property is much less constraining the partition function, or for our purposes, the charge spectrum for a given mass level. But the excitation mass is again reliably computed at weak gauge coupling uh, because the emergent heterotic string in 4D is also weakly coupled, just like in 60. So, having seen in 60 that the quasimodular property of the partition function validates the subladdice weak gravity conjecture, uh, we can try to test if even this reduced control in 4D suffices. And what, we, what we've confirmed is that uh, indeed it suffices. So uh, the way things work in 4D theory is uh, really essentially the same as in 60. Uh, this is how the internal geometry of X4 determined the uh, 60 EFT. And in much the same way, the internal geometry of X6 determines the four dimensional EFT of F theory. So we just need to adjust various cycle uh, dimensions, but essentially it's the same. The seven brains uh, are wrapping around the internal four cycle now, S4, uh, give rise to the gauge fields, and the gauge coupling is inversely proportional to the volume of it. Uh, so for the weak gauge coupling, we need to consider expanding S4. And once again, this implies that there exists a shrinking two-dimensional cycle inside the X6, uh, which I will still call C2. And in turn, this implies that uh, by wrapping D3 on it, uh, there arises a weakly coupled light hydraulic string in this limit. Um, so at weak gauge coupling, the four-dimensional effective action uh, again turns into a dilatonic Einstein-Maxwell theory, but now with the dilaton coupling, alpha equals square root two. Then the extremal charge mass ratio is computed as one. So we now know what to do about the, um, the, the, the light tower of heterodic excitations here. We first need to clarify uh, the maximal U1 charge Q max for a given mass level N. And we need to uh, find uh, the, the value of the mass levels N uh, for which the um, corresponding U, maximal U1 charge Q max obey this inequality and test if such Q maxes fill a charge sub lattice. Uh, for this purpose, uh, once again, we need to uh, compute this prefactor in the lower bound, mu string. And indeed, uh, this value turns out to agree with the uh, mu extremum. Uh, and once again, this is a model independent result. So uh, this way we have verified the uh, uh, weak gravity conjecture in its sub lattice version, even for the four dimensional EFTs of F theory for all of them. So this is again, pretty powerful. Uh, however, uh, it's not the end of the story yet. Shrinking cycles in principle lead to a correction to any classical geometric calculations of the physics. And unlike in 60F theory, the four dimensional EFTs uh, do suffer from corrections. Um, and without going through the, uh, uh, all the detailed analysis here, uh, let me just uh, share the result of our computations. Uh, things just work out so nicely that it works even after incorporating the quantum effects. Uh, to be more precise, 
there arise some leading corrections to various classical volumes, um, which are not negligible because they are only numerically suppressed as opposed to parametrically suppressed. However, um, in computing this important parameter mu string, uh, this ratio uh, turns out to uh, be still one, even after considering the leading correction, they just cancel out in this, uh, uh, in this combination. Uh, furthermore, by also considering subleading corrections, uh, we can also, we, we have been able to propose a slight modification of the weak gravity uh, criterion, but uh, let me not get into all the details of this. Um, instead, I will just get you uh, the dessert um, after going through all these equations. So um, it will be about some, some other swamp plane conjecture that I said, and no equation will appear anymore. So uh, you can sit back and enjoy this dessert. Um, so let me start with the distance conjecture. So our athletic test of the weak gravity conjecture concerns weak gauge coupling achievable at infinite distance in the parameter space. And interestingly, uh, an independent conjecture known as the distance conjecture had claimed that at infinite distance in moduli space, an infinite tower of states must become light. <clears throat> and later on, uh, this conjecture was refined in 2019 to the uh, emergent string conjecture, according to which at infinite distance, the theory either decompactifies or reduces to a weakly coupled critical string theory. So uh, the former case, decompactification leads to a light KK tower and the latter case to a light string excitation tower. So the emergent string conjecture clarifies the very physical nature of the light tower, which emerges at infinite distance according to the distance conjecture. So in this sense, it is a refinement of the distance conjecture. Uh, note in particular that the uh, subtlest amount of the weak gravity particles, which we have identified that weak gauge coupling uh, regime of F theory, uh, they themselves form a light tower of uh, uh, states um, of which presence is predicted by the distance conjecture. Uh, furthermore, uh, they arise as um, the, the uh, a string excitation of a light weakly coupled a critical string, which emerge in the limit uh, as predicted by the emergent string conjecture. So a lot of non-trivial checks have recently been made on infinite distance limits of string effective field theories, and they all support this refined proposal on string emergence, as it turns out. And what we've witnessed in this talk uh, is the string emergence in some special infinite distance limits of F theory, um, which amount to the physics of weak gauge coupling. Uh, however, a lot of string, uh, well, strong pieces of evidence arise in many other uh, different non-trivial string setups. So uh, this conjecture had so far been uh, uh, pretty strongly supported. Uh, the next conjecture to be discussed is the completeness, um, which claims that uh, all the charges are to be to be to be to be filled by physical uh, physical states, not just the solid charges. And well, naturally, indeed, the excitation modes provide massive particles with an arbitrary charge. So we've seen this graph, which indicates the maximum one charges at a given mass level uh, uh, by these dots. Um, but the heterotic partition function, uh, in fact, tells us that. At each mass level n, uh, the, uh, the, the, the degeneracies are non-zero all the way up to Q max. So there are states at each site in the charge lattice at each mass level up to Q max. Uh, in particular, no gaps are allowed in the charge spectrum. Uh, and finally, let me very briefly comment on no global symmetry. Um, at weak gauge coupling, we have uh, seen that an infinite tower of particles become light, which indicates that the effective description of the physics breaks down. In particular, the strict weak gauge coupling limit is not part of the moduli space. In other words, the U1 gauge vector cannot lead to a strict global U1 symmetry, which supports the no global symmetry conjecture. So with that, let me summarize the talk. <clears throat> uh, the weak gravity conjecture claims weakness of gravity not as a coincidence in our nature, but as a general feature of quantum gravity. Uh, 
Uh, more precisely, the minimal version predicts a weak gravity particle with mass more than charge in reference to the extremal black holes. And the stabilized version uh, conjectures a charged sublattice to be filled by weak gravity particles. We have discussed strong top down evidence for the weak gravity conjecture from string theory. Microscopically, the weak gravity particles arise from the excitations of a critical string. Uh, this was most obvious from the hydraulic on a torus. Uh, what's perhaps been uh, more exciting is that in the weak gauge coupling limits of F theory, a light critical string, uh, a hydraulic string necessarily emerges to realize the solid weak gravity conjecture. Specifically, the realization of the conjecture has been conspired by the universal features of all these things. A, the asymptotic effective action governing the black hole solution in the theory, B, the internal geometry, and C, the hydraulic worship partition function uh, and its, its properties. Uh, for a bonus, our athletic analysis has also served as evidence for some other conjectures such as string emergence, no global symmetry and completeness. And uh, these are the uh, um, top-down messages I wanted to convey to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the most constant and the digital space. Which evidence you showed today is buried in the digital space? Sorry, which evidence I show about? Which evidence you showed today is still buried in digital space? Ah. Um, so, okay, I should say that uh, this talk was actually, I mean, the, 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 all the evidence here was entirely focusing on the Minkowski background to begin with. In fact, it turns out that the analysis in, well, in the theory, in, in, in the, in the inter external space with even a very small cosmological constant should be very different from the Minkowski. So, but in fact, I can tell you something because something I did not mention because it's a, a pretty much of detail, but in 4DF theory, which was the last strongest evidence, oops, yeah. Yeah, F3 in four dimensions. So here, although I said it's a, it's a, it's a Minkowski space uh, externally, uh, uh, in fact, there is a potential. And if you consider everything, then somehow you should consider this as a, a, as background with some small cosmic constant. So in some sense, even if the, the, the space will admit some small cosmic constant here, uh, either de sitter or anti de sitter, I'm not sure, uh, uh, the weak gravity conjecture still holds. So uh, in this sense, somehow we end up uh, verifying the conjecture even in the space with some small cosmic constant here, but um, well, the general, uh, general, 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 general background here was that we, we were doing everything in Minkowski. But as a bonus, we ended up confirming the conjecture even for such a space in four dimensional FTP. predicted, then uh, I don't expect there to be any surprising reserve. So whether you can generalize it to a more plausible case where this uh, conjugate is applicated for, or, or am I missing something? <laughs> okay, good question. So first of all, I would say that uh, the evidence I showed you was actually uh, not too obvious. Um, so already here, um, you might, well, you might feel that everything worked out so nicely. So, okay, so it was pretty obvious, but in fact, we didn't expect this to work. 
So we wanted to we wanted to actually at first see whether such vacua would break some of the um, 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 uh, conjectures, violate some of them. But in fact, it turned out that uh, uh, in all such compactifications, the conjectures uh, were valid. So of course, now speaking of cosmological constant, as in the previous question, uh, we have not addressed this issue uh, most uh, uh, seriously, but uh, already in this Minkowski background, it was not trivial. So uh, I would view this as a very non-trivial piece of evidence. Um, but of course, we should consider many other cases as well from the top down. And um, many works are uh, uh, being done and uh, you will hear a lot about uh, such, such research results. Yeah, thank you. So my question is about uh, just the importance of supposedly mm -hmm. uh, in your examples, uh, whether the shrink of a border line depends on supposedly or the I mean, if you suppose that if you break supposedly completely, whether your conjecture falls. Right. So. As you well, as you've seen, uh, uh, well, it becomes a much more difficult task as you as you keep lowering the number of supersymmetries. So we started from sixteen supercharges, and then we went to eight, and then four, and the, the level of tasks becomes uh, more and more difficult. And uh, in the end, of course, we would want to we want want to see uh, uh, non supersymmetric theories, uh, which uh, I, I I don't have much to say about uh, here, um, but. Let me at least tell you, because now you're talking about the shrinking cycle, the, uh, the regime we are looking at here is, in a sense, the, the runaway regime. So it turns out, so we've computed the uh, flux induced D-term potential and the uh, also F-term potential coming from the non perturbative generated super potential. It turns out that the, 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 uh, this limit, the, the moduli controlling this limit, uh, turns out to be sort of a runaway-like uh, 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 pseudo-moduli. So, Maybe that's what I can say about the shrinking cycle and the, 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 the regime in the, in the Keller moduli space for that. Uh, but this is not to say that I can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can address this question properly. But yeah, it, 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 it should be done. I think the non supersymmetric EFTs should be much more serious to study. And, and I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a really important question, but one at a time, I would say. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I two questions. One question is basically just asking your knowledge. So, for this complete uh, conjecture, I mean, for, first of all, for weak random conjecture, at least we started it with some physical arguments like uh, experiment black hole must yeah. be able to decay. So, then uh, can you comment or, or tell us what was the original physics uh, argument that um, complete this conjecture needs to, needs to be satisfied? Or is it true? I mean, I, mean, I understand the statement, but where did it come from? Can, can you explain it? Oh, so I, yeah, I can't remember the details. So it's, I can say it's, 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 it's given by Pochinsky uh, in sure. 2003. <laughs> it's, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, it's coming from some, uh, some uh, well, some thought experiment on um, um, certain, certain operators in a certain operator in the theory. Uh, I forget the detail. Um, yeah, I, I can't say I can say the uh, right, uh, argument here, but yeah. Right. Okay, then uh, my second second one is the question. So um, you mentioned that in your analysis, it was crucial that uh, this experimental uh, mm -hmm. the mu experimental they agree. is yes. very under the complication, right? Uh, you mean the 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 heterody case? You mean? Yes. Yeah, that's true. So so yeah, the Heidenreich, Reese, and Rudelius stated it. Right. Yes. Please. So, so given the fact that we understand that under, uh, the underlying quantum, quantum gravity is it lives in higher dimensions, and we need to get to four dimensions. So generically, we, we we know that we have to go through this uh, complexification process. And uh, how how much do we understand the properties of weak gravity conjecture or conjectures in general are you know either invariant under those process of decomplexification. Or if so, then can that property shed some light on the understanding of a string landscape? For instance, for instance, like this version of the complexification invalidate the graph conjecture, the other direction is good, so we can, and so on. I'm just questioning. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for the question. So 
Actually, this was the original motivation, maybe one motivation they, they had in, in, in doing this analysis. So because, because of all of these quantum gravity conjectures, swamp line conjectures are to be satisfied for any quantum gravity theories across dimensions, they wanted to have the conjecture uh, valid in uh, any quantum gravity theories in any dimensions. And in particular, if the conjecture holds in the high dimensional theory, then it better also holds in lower dimensional theory obtained by the dimensional reduction, for example. Not even compactivity, but, but more complicated compactivity, but circle reduction to begin with. And this way, uh, they could propose strongly that the weak gravity conjecture in its minimal version should in fact be strengthened to some bolder version such as the sublattice weak gravity conjecture. Actually, they started with the uh, lattice weak gravity conjecture, but, and then they stepped back a little bit to say it's just a sublattice weak gravity conjecture. Mm -hmm. But essentially they, they require the stability of this conjecture under dimensional reduction, as you are suggesting. And indeed they could propose that probably a bolder version of the weak gravity conjecture should be valid. And that was the sublattice or lattice weak gravity conjecture. So this was precisely the, 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 the philosophy they had in mind. I see, yeah. thank you. Thanks. So uh, I just have uh, a question, a uh, comment about uh, what you said. Mm -hmm. It ultimately relates also to the question about the, about the, the importance of supersymmetry in your, uh, in your construction and also to the importance of loop corrections. So eventually what we want from this one conjecture and from the weak gravity conjecture is that they help us in building effective field theory that in some way can complete or can emerge from something more yeah. microscopic, something yes. more fundamental. Mm -hmm. So at some point I want a four-dimensional effective field theory that, that describes the physical world and that has no supersymmetry, that is broken supersymmetry up to some high scale. So if I take the argument and if I take, for example, the black hole argument, I would, uh, let me say, immediately conclude that the, the, the quantities I'm talking about, the topics and the masses, are the pole mass, the, the, the quantities calculated at the pole, uh, for, for the pole mass, and so the, the, the coupling calculated there. But I know also that in an effective field theory, I have a dynamical dressing of quantities due to uh, what, well, the, the way we treat things. So we know it from, uh, from a randomization group uh, uh, point of view. But here, what I wanted to ask you is that from this string theoretic perspective, I am trying to build this from a top-down approach. So you're going from a microscopic thing, from a uh, high energy uh, framework. You're trying to derive something for the low energy framework. So uh, how, do, how do you see this in, in this picture of, uh, of quantities, uh, couplings that are dynamically dressed when, uh, when scales change? I would say that here, what Basically, what you are calculating are more things that uh, would relate at the threshold where you have this, uh, uh, where you have the, where you go from high energy degrees of freedom to low energy degrees of freedom that would be the field theory degrees of freedom. So uh, I, I see a sort of contrast from the black hole argument. It seems to me natural to think about pole mass and countries calculated at the pole mass. But from this one, I'm talking about the UV theory. So. I would say that more than it is a high energetic uh, constraint, and then in some way it is dressed in the infrared. And we should see what, how the dressing uh, changes things. Yeah, so, so I, I haven't discussed the issue at all. Yeah, thanks for the question. So this was more at some higher energy scale, maybe, as you as you are, as you are guessing. And indeed, the conjectures better be valid in any energy scales, very low energy, as there is some bottom up intuitions about all of these conjectures. So you can even think about, as you say, renormalization group or a flow of all these couplings and see if the, if the conjecture still hold. And such study has been, has been, uh, has been done and but it, things work very nicely. But here, indeed, I, I was just starting from very, very high energy and then just get to the compactification and then I was seeing whether, whether the conjecture holds there. But yeah, indeed, I have not addressed this issue, but there has been lots of study about that as well. But it, things work out very nicely so far. I can just say positively. Oh. So last question. I wonder. So. 
helpful. I wonder if you happen to have um, any comment or opinion about the recent researches to Festina Lentebound by Montero, Bier, and Bafa. <laughs> they said um, the lower bound, not upper bound of the charted particle in effective theory construction. Yeah, so this is in the, uh, again with cosmological constant, right? Maybe you maybe can talk about it later. So I, I haven't really thought much about it, but I read a bit about this. And, um, but indeed, in the De Sitter space, the black hole solution structure is very different, and you get some upper bound, lower bound, all of this. Uh, it's very different. So that's what I said, why I said um, things are very different, even if you have just a small cosmological constant, either positive mm -hmm. or negative, things go very differently. So, um, so this talk has not been about that at all, and but maybe maybe we can discuss privately later. Right. Yeah, that's all the question. Yeah, but this is a very important, and interesting issue. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Now, the entropy, geometry, and physics. Yeah, uh, first, uh, I should make an excuse that uh, the original talk title was this uh, uh, very nice title, but uh, during the internal discussion, I was not approved to talk about the most exciting part of the uh, research. It will take um, more time, but I will. Uh, try to cover the other parts, which is using the uh, mutual information to com complete this uh, machine and learning. So the basic idea is uh, um, we, uh, so, so during this talk, I will spend more than half in introducing this uh, information theory technology and concepts. And then in the latter part, I will apply to the uh, Higgs to Daimion, the specific collider examples. So the a basic question is uh, how much information is present in HEP data? I mean, we have all these uh, data sets from the colliders, the full momentum and jet energy and all these things. And how much uh, information we can extract from this data? That's a very important question. And how much information do collider variables share? Uh, meaning that uh, we typically say that uh, in, for this process, this variable is the most important and for the other process, this is the important. And that came from our intuition in physics for long uh, time, but we can quantify all these uh, dependence or the redundancy of variables. And so this uh, dependence and independence is a very important concept in uh, data analysis. And also what is the most uh, relevant and efficient set of input data? This is exactly what we were trying to do. I mean, the good physicists or good uh, experimentalists analysts always say that for this process, this is the dominant uh, input parameter, which will determine all the uh, important observables. And therefore we don't have to worry about the others. That's our intuition, right? And we want to quantify it. And is it possible to construct machine learning models robust to physical uh, variables of interest? Meaning that. Could you clarify what is supposed to mean by the variables and the physical variables? So the collider variables means the observables in colliders, like the 
for momentum or the energy scale or whatever. And then the physical variable is like the Higgs mass or the cross sections or all these yeah, yeah, parameters of the Lagrangian that we want to fix. Yeah, thanks for the question. So if, if there is something very basic that I didn't explain, please let me know. Or um, robust to the uncertainties introduced by unknown systematics. So suppose that there is a, uh, Monte Carlo generator one and two and three all give a different result. And then we want to build a setup where basically our result is independent of all these Monte Carlo, right? So, so these are the questions that I'm uh, trying to address. So for doing that, I will introduce or share the basic uh, knowledge with you. So we first, we need to define information as you know very well. Uh, an event with the probability one has no information because we know that it happens for sure. And an event with less, informa uh, less probability has more information because it is less likely. So if it happens, then it's uh, really a big event. So the total information from two in independent events should be the sum of its information. So this is an extra uh, condition that we require for this information to be defined. And therefore, I would define the information as one of probability. I mean, the inverse of the probability. As, as the probability is uh, smaller, uh, we have more information. But in order to satisfy this condition that two independent events uh, provides the sum as the total information, and then the functional form is entirely fixed by a logarithm, right? So this is the information. So I is log one of P. Later, I will be used for uh, the other uh, uh, concept, but so you should remember that information is log one of P. And this is called Shannon entropy and they satisfy all the properties listed above. And then uh, we can uh, uh, talk about this entropy. You might be familiar with the thermodynamics that this entropy is nothing but the average, the expectation value of the information. So this entropy is nothing but the information summed with the weight of the probability, or in other words, the expectation of the information. And differential entropy, we can also define like those uh, uh, discrete set for the continuous variables. So now we define probability distribution function, which depends continuously on variables, px, and then the summation is replaced by the integral. And this is what is called differential entropy. So naively you would think it's the same thing like the entropy that we know, but you immediately discover that uh, there are some property which is not familiar with our uh, probability interpretation. For example, the probability that we know always satisfy the inequality that it is uh, uh, equal or bigger than zero or uh, maximum is one. But for this PDF, doesn't follow that constraints. And we write it as an expectation value with the PDFP. So it's the same expression, right? And then uh, for joint entropy, meaning that if there is a variable X and Y, there are two sets of variables. And then we can define this joint entropy as uh, uh, using the joint PDF. What is? EP. EP, the, the expectation value of this information with respect to PDF P. So this, term, uh, this expression will be used uh, repeatedly. So it's the same expression. So I'm, I'm oh, defining you this. You define that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a standard terminology in the literature. So for the information, I take the expectation value. And then whenever we are talking about the expectation value, always you should choose the PDF of your distribution. Yeah. So for the differential entropy or the continuous entropy is different from the entropy that we count and is familiar. And that, that you can see from 
uh, this integral that basically we can map this integral into the sum by dividing the area by delta and then take the average PDF as P bar and then we can map it into PI in the discrete sum. And then you see that all the remaining terms vanish here, but eventually there is an extra piece coming from this delta uh, from here, right? So, so Px, if we divide like this, and then basically it is mapped into the sum by one to one, but this log Px has a two piece, one of Pi and then one of delta, uh, one of log delta. And this delta, I will send it to zero eventually because I can uh, just discretize as much as I want. And then you find the connection between those uh, uh, discrete value versus continuous or differential entropy. And they differ by infinity. So in principle, uh, this can be arbitrarily small or negative. And so the uh, differential entropy doesn't have those uh, positivity bound or whatever. And uh, continuously, I can define this uh, cross entropy. I told you that this is the expectation value uh, with some choice of the PDF. So for my function GX, uh, the natural choice would be GX here, but I can use a different F and G and can define this uh, as a cross entropy, meaning that if I have uh, two different PDF, I can compare, I mean, how different they are. And then also I can define this conditional entropy. So all these uh, names, conditional and joint, are stemming from the definition of PDF. If the probability is uh, conditional, and then the expectation value using that PDF is called conditional. And if the PDF is joint, then also the entropy is joint. So that definition would be very uh, straightforward. But in all cases, this P implying that the PDF that I'm using in this expression should be the joint or the full PDF of the full data space. And then uh, the first non-trivial concept that uh, uh, some might be familiar, but most of uh, people will not be the uh, fragment divergence. So the concept is very clear. So this is defined for some convex function. So convex downward, if there is a convex function, and then we can define those divergence as a FP, minus FQ and the naive uh, Taylor expansion, the, the difference between uh, these two. So you see that F, uh, P minus FQ is this one. And then this uh, naive uh, Taylor expansion uh, provides you this amount and therefore you end up with this uh, green uh, difference in this expression. And the reason why it is called divergence is it's like the metric, almost like the distance, but it is not symmetric with respect to P and Q exchange. And therefore it is typically called uh, divergence. And they are non-negative for all the choice of P and Q. And it is zero only when these P and Q are the same in all X. So, uh, this all stem from the convexity of the function. Since the function is convex uh, for any choice of this uh, P and Q, always you can uh, see that this uh, divergence is uh, positive mapping, right? Or zero. And then uh, from this uh, Bregman divergence, we can take a very special form of F related to the entropy, like log F, and then, uh, or x log x. So then taking this FP as uh, x log x, I can define this divergence as this expression and taking a uh, gradient, I end up with this uh, uh, 
So, so taking a derivative of uh, x log x, I end up with the log x plus one, and they provide you two terms. And if you summarize, and then they end up with uh, this nice expression that it comes with the PDF and kind of entropy of Q and P. So if it is well <clears throat> normalized, since it is a PDF, uh, the summation should be equal to one for them. And this is called uh, Kullback light divergence. So I introduced you two uh, definitions. One is the Bregman divergence, which is defined on a, uh, uh, defined with a convex function. And using that, the special case of uh, convex function x log x provides you Kullback live load evidence, which is mostly used in uh, uh, information theory. So this is the one that we are trying to use repeatedly. So the Kullback live load evidence is defined as Px times log Px over Qx. So this is, in other words, oh, this should be P. So log P over Q with the PDF choice of uh, P. And this function stems from Bregman divergence, and therefore it uh, is equal to zero only when these uh, two PDFs are the same. So it's, it's really a strong statement. And in terms of entropy or the differential entropy, we see that this uh, uh, DKL P and Q is nothing but the cross entropy of P and Q uh, minus the entropy of P itself. So this is the uh, clear physical interpretation of uh, uh, Kullback libel evidence. And I, I'm sorry for inconvenience due to some conflict of these notations, but uh, at the moment, this is the best that I could do. So I think uh, for relative entropy or for mutual information, I will use this uh, semicolon. So comparing two, uh, because this uh, bar, uh, this is the only exception. So this uh, divergence is typically defined with the uh, uh, double bar, but this bar is uh, usually used for conditional PDF. So if I'm trying to ask what is the probability of uh, finding particle at X, given it is at Y, things like that. So that conditional is usually uh, uh, we express using bar and then comma is used for the joint PDF for joint uh, entropy, meaning that in full space, what is the probability then I, I describe it as a P X comma Y comma G comma things like this. So for all joint, it is used uh, as comma, but for Bregman divergence, also the same comma is used when you compare and for KL divergence, the same bar is used to compare. So only for divergence, uh, this uh, notation is used for different uh, uh, meaning. So, so what are the logistics of all uh, cross-entropy relative entropy? Are they the same? Uh, no, no, no. So yeah, thanks for asking that again. So the cross-entropy is, so, so you know what is the typical uh, standard entropy, PDF and PDF. So. Cross entropy is uh, the different choice of PDF in one place and the other. Uh, relative entropy is the difference between two. Uh, where? I think, uh, yeah, I. I Okay. So, so first the conditional entropy is uh, the one with the conditional PDF. And then uh, what is the relative entropy? Okay. I forgot, we will see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, the name, yeah. So, so I think uh, mutual information is defined as uh, using relative entropy. We will see. Yeah. 
So for this special property, I mean, as I emphasize this cool back rivalry reverse is defined this way and is always non-negative. And then you might wonder why this equal to zero only if or these uh, two PDFs are equal in all space or all X. Uh, the, to exercise this, actually, we can start from the same PDF and vary one of the PDF slightly. And in doing so, the essential part is uh, this normalization should be kept. And therefore, if you want to increase PDF by delta Q in one place, then it should be compensated by minus delta Q in other place. So that uh, small variation always should be accompanied together. And then this uh, convexity of the function just guarantees that whenever you make a variation, always you end up with a positive quantity coming from it. Therefore, it just proves that uh, basically this is, the only, uh, this is the only solution that provides the vanishing Kullback libel divergence. And so <clears throat> I explained this conditional, uh, and for conditional probability, there is a very nice feature that this PY times the conditional probability is uh, the joint probability. And the same for the other uh, combination. And the conditional entropy is defined this way. And then in terms of this joint entropy and the original entropy, basically conditional entropy is given uh, this way. And similarly, uh, we can define all these things. So using Venn diagram, you can see that if this uh, left circle denotes the entropy of X and right circle denotes the entropy of Y, and then the conditional entropy is this yellow and green part. So they just uh, omit those uh, intersection part. And this intersection part is what is called mutual information. And uh, mutual information is uh, basically the uh, entropy of X minus the conditional entropy given Y. So this, uh, 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 so, so I told you that this, Conditional entropy is this uh, yellow part. So among this X, if you remove the yellow part and only the intersection is remained, and there is uh, the other way of defining it, starting from Y, you can remove those conditional, uh, conditional entropy and also you are left with the same pink region. And this is called mutual information. <laughs> and if you write down all the expression using the original definition, then this mutual information is written in terms of the joint PDF with the product of the individual. So you can view it as this one as a conditional uh, PDF, right? Px comma y over Px is a Px given y, uh, uh, P, Py given x. And then this is a Py. Therefore, basically this is the same as the conditional entropy minus the entropy of Y and things like this. So you can easily see the expression in terms of the PDF. And then uh, the same expression as I told you, when there are function F and G, these are the expression of kullback libel divergence. And therefore uh, I can define mutual information as kullback libel divergence of joint PDF and product of PDF. Therefore, uh, this uh, mutual information vanishes only when this joint entropy is equal to Px times Py. This is the most uh, crucial observation. And also this, uh, you can compare this mutual information with the Pearson correlation coefficient, the typical correlation coefficient defined in terms of uh, uh, variance and covariance uh, with the normalization. And then whenever there is a correlation, the mutual, uh, mutual information is uh, defined this way. So I just use this notation of delta for a uh, specific reason that this uh, Pearson coefficient is defined globally. So if the, there is a distribution, then you just compute the variance and 
variance in the full data set. So it's a single number, but I can just divide the data event into a patch and can define inside the patch all these uh, uh, Pearson coefficient. And then it's uh, quasi local in the sense and can compare it. And as I told you that this mutual information is really a, a local concept in the sense that mutual information vanishes, meaning that all those uh, individual integrum should be zero for this to vanish. So this uh, uh, vanishing mutual information is achieved only when X and Y are independent. In other words, this joint probability is this product of uh, individual ones. So uh, you might be confused by this uh, dependence and the correlation coefficient. So for instance, this covariance can be computed as a sum. You know, this covariance is uh, just the expectation value of X and Y at the same time with the whole data set. And you might naively think that this determines the dependence. However, vanishing covariance doesn't mean that they are independent because there are typical cases like this or the quadratic form where the uh, correlation exists locally, but they add up to zero, right? Since this is a single number, always this correlation coefficient can be zero, even if they are dependent uh, everywhere. So it's very important to have a local concepts for the independence. So this mutual information distinguishes it from those uh, correlation coefficient. So as I emphasized, I can view this F as, let's say, let's uh, take an example that F is A square, which is non-negative. And then if you integrate it over and define it capital F, if capital F is zero, then this A should be zero everywhere because uh, the integrand cannot be negative. And uh, the fact that it is zero means that everything should be zero. And the same thing is true for this uh, callback library divergence and this joint and uh, product of PDF should be equal for all these things, which guarantees that this X and Y are independent. So it's, a, it's really a local uh, concepts that they are independent. And then also uh, in the literature, you can find this uh, point-wise mutual information as just a, a ratio of this joint and product of PDF. So if you define it this way, then naively when there is a correlation, always there is a, uh, this uh, joint PDF is always bigger than the product. So naively you would expect a positive uh, uh, number for this. But uh, if you just take arbitrary PDF, then it can be uh, greater than one or less than one. And therefore you might have a hard time in interpreting this uh, negative uh, uh, mutual information. So people define positive PMI as if it is negative, then throw it away and only take the positive value or you can normalize it with the original entropy of this uh, uh, local entropy density of this PDF. And this uh, NPMI takes a value from minus one to one, meaning that if it is equal to one, they are perfectly correlated. It is equal to zero, it's one, therefore they are independent. If it is minus one, it means that if Y happened, then X never happens. So all these are used in uh, language model. As you know, this uh, GPT very well. So they use this uh, in a strongest way that if you analyze the language model, then some words come with the other. And therefore this uh, PMI to the power plays a crucial role in what word should be connected with the other or should not. And this is a really a meaningful concept that is used everywhere. And then also you can define the metric and all this uh, information quality ratio, but let me go back to the main question. So I explained to you what mutual information is and then how to estimate this mutual information is the most uh, challenging part. 
And recently, in recent uh, two or three years, people have used this uh, um, neural estimators, which are based on variational representation of uh, callback libel law divergence. So if you try to use this uh, callback libel law divergence, you have to know the PDF in advance. However, from the data set, uh, it's very hard to compute because we don't know the exact PDF. We only have the data distribution. So we need some analytic function of PX in order to compute it. And that's the most difficult part. So this underlying PDF is not known a priori, and therefore it is very hard to estimate uh, mutual information. And uh, let me explain how then people use this idea of uh, neural estimate to compute this uh, mutual information. Um, so I, I want to be very short, but there are this uh, DV representation, meaning that if you are familiar with uh, this uh, thermodynamics, then basically you can view this as a partition function. So for arbitrary function Tx, you can also define this e to the Tx and then uh, expectation value with respect to some PDF. And so basically this G could be uh, just a partition function with some PDF Q. And then I can define my small g as partition uh, normalized with the PDF Q and e to the t. And then uh, all these expressions are rewritten very nicely that expectation value of t and then log of uh, uh, these partition function can be just uh, grabbed into this big parenthesis because this is just a number and therefore I can rewrite it and then multiply Q divided by Q. And then this part is nothing but my GX. So I can replace this with the GX and then I end up with the GX over QX expectation value of P. So this is the expression here. And then pullback libel law evidence originally is uh, uh, has a definition here. And therefore, uh, left-hand side minus right-hand side can be written as another callback libel law divergence. And therefore, they can be zero only when P and uh, G are the same. So this is a proof that why this uh, naive representation works. So. Since we don't know what is the PDF of the original distribution, which is P, we just, uh, uh, or for given P, we don't know Q and try to uh, map Q into P. And then we just uh, pick up arbitrary function of T and then compute it. And then there is a supremum, which just to saturate this uh, inequality. And therefore this is what machine learning uh, can do. And in practical purpose, actually, this F divergence works better because you don't need log and they are just as good as, I mean, not the best one, but uh, it's fast one. And therefore, uh, practically, this is uh, also used. So uh, I think uh, the, the essential part is basically we are using all these trial functions to train and the machine, and you just uh, compute this combination for all possible t's, and then find the uh, extremum, and that just uh, provides you the lower bound on your mutual information. So this is how the training works, and then combining with the cons I mean observation that mutual information is equal to zero is equivalent to say that locally, I mean, basically X and Y are perfectly independent, right? So I can use this uh, machine not to learn something. So this is the idea of machine unlearning. So I apply this into a uh, Higgs to daimyo process. So we were working on this Higgs to daimyo process for many years as 
before this uh, three sigma observation because we thought that this is the most uh, interesting channel to observe BSM or confirm the star model. And then in doing so, uh, the main observation is that although the uh, Higgs production is dominated by global fusion, this Higgs to dimion is analyzed by this vector boson fusion, which is 10 times smaller cross-section. So uh, the reason why we are using vector boson fusion, so this vector boson fusion provides the strongest uh, uh, constraint or the significance why glu Higgs is uh, even uh, behind it is because although the cross-section is 10 times smaller, it has a clean uh, signal, meaning best background. That's why you could use it. But uh, glu, glu fusion also can be used if you use the initial state radiation uh, in a uh, clever way, meaning that uh, ISL has a different properties that if it is from glu glu uh, fusion, then they emit more gluon-like ISL. And for uh, the others, it's different. So if you can distinguish the quark and gluon nature of ISL, basically you can also distinguish the uh, background from the signals. Background here is dominated by Drelian, which is more, which has more quark-like uh, ISL, and therefore you can improve it a lot. Uh, but uh, the the main problem is they have a, a serious issues. So in order to distinguish this quark and gluon uh, ISL, we have to implement this uh, deep learning techniques. And then once you implement it, then machine runs daimion invariant mass first, rather than those uh, distinguishing quark and gluon jets. And then uh, when you just uh, finally uh, try to reconstruct all the significance, you end up with uh, some troubles because uh, your uh, signal and background doesn't respect the original uh, invariant mass distribution. So, uh, we had a motivation of getting the uh, deep learning technique, which doesn't spoil nice invariant mass distribution because invariant mass is something that we need to pin down the exact mass of the Higgs. But for machine learning, should be used to uh, distinguish something else. But they are so smart that they know that this is an easy way and they just use this. Uh, invariant mass, and therefore we ask them not to learn uh, this invariant mass. So that was the uh, whole idea. So if you just uh, do the analysis without using this, uh, without implementing this uh, machine learning, then for the signal, you just categorize five different regions, then all those uh, invariant mass distribution is different. And what is more interesting is basically your background, which should not depend, I mean, should not have a feature in it, but should be exponentially decaying. Actually, if you divide it into these five categories, then there is a very uh, unique feature in it. So they are entirely screwed up. And so for signal and background, so for different signal to background region, basically they have a really a different distribution of uh, uh, invariant mass. And we checked that actually, if you look for mutual information uh, after finding this significance, then you realize that they use this invariant mass the most. So this is the most important variable determining the signal. And also from the scoreboard, uh, uh, the shape is like this. But if you apply this uh, machine unlearning technique and implying that uh, for the signals, this uh, mutual information with the invariant mass should be zero is applied. And then you see that independently of those uh, signal regions, all have the same feature in uh, diamond invariant mass. Um, now the background is really the background, which is not spoiled. And now this invariant mass for the signal and background for different uh, signal to background region are coincide with each other. Now we didn't touch this invariant mass distribution and could use those uh, 
machine learning to identify POG and GLOM ISL and can improve the significance much better without spoiling the precision of the Higgs mass. <coughs> and now also we check this uh, mutual information that for the signal, uh, mutual information is zero. So they didn't learn Daimion in there. And also for the background, there is a tiny one, but it's uh, negligible compared to that substructure variables. That's it. So uh, I think uh, I managed to finish it in on time. So deep learning is very helpful in many examples, including jet substructure studies for signal and background discrimination. And often it distorts the very nice invariant mass distribution of the signal. And precision measurement is possible if nice features are preserved, like uh, I did. So machine can unlearn certain input by minimizing mutual information. And vanishing mutual information guarantees the independence of two variables. Thank you. Everything was clear. So in the background, you have a peak. Yeah. And more 25 is here. What do they peak? Uh, so you see that there are something that is uh, screwing up your signal and background. So, so you, um, how can I say? So you have uh, various categories that uh, just uh, divide the number of events. And then uh, you see that if I go to this direction, then there are more signals and therefore that provides my cut. But if you go to that regime and then uh, basically they also select uh, more, uh, how can I say? So, so they, they select signals, but also in the background, they have more of uh, signal-like events. Okay, so they- uh, So, so okay, basically so all, all so these, uh, the yeah, all these are stemming from uh, here. So, so basically if there were number of events, which is uh, categorized by daimyon invariant variables, then all this distribution should be the same. But now you have, lag of those events here and more of these events here. And therefore my uh, uh, criterion doesn't preserve oh. the time on invariant mass. And so- So, basically, so you, have, you, have to, uh, you have to teach the machine what to learn or what to learn? Yeah, that's uh, the essential idea. So this is, I think this is so our- <laughs> No, they are too, stu uh, too smart. smart. Yeah, so they- Know that if they use dynamic invariant mass, they don't have to the exercise so for the remaining. Uh, process. Uh, so you have to you yourself have to de determine uh, what should be learned, what should not learn. Ah, uh, yeah. So this for this specific, specific example, we know that this dynamic invariant mass, even still for the human beings, can uh, identify the signal. So we don't need the help of the machine, and therefore we just ask. Uh, the machine to do the task of a higher level, meaning the jet uh, flavor discrimination. So whether, I mean, we can separate these two, that's an important question. And we, we believe that we are the first who uh, proposed this mechanism, yeah. So how much improvement did you make? Uh, the number, I don't, I don't have it. I mean, the paper will come out in a month. I'm <laughs> pretty sure. It's 1%. <laughs> The, I think the crucial point is there is a CMS analysis, but based on this method. And therefore, it's, it, I mean, the improvement itself is not that great in the sense, but their analysis cannot guarantee the significance because they just used those uh, invariant mass dependent one and then added the significance coming from invariant mass. So it's unclear whether we can trust their significance by 100%. And we provide the most reliable estimates and therefore our result is really reliable. Therefore, I would say that the previous number 
is overestimated, although the number looks similar. You don't believe me. Okay. <laughs> Over there. Uh. Well, my question is a kind of a general question. So you consider this new pair mode, but uh, probably in order to prove this standard model picture, you have to also uh, uh, measure this uh, fixed tooth tubulon and also CC bar. So can you apply your- Very, very good. Very good case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not aiming uh, to invest all my resources into collider physics. But as you said, I mean, that's uh, one of the most challenging parts that people are trying to uh, measure those hex to glue glue and hex to charm pairs. Uh, and that's, that's the most important topic. I don't know what, what is the up to date uh, status of it, but uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. That's, you know. So you are talking. It's such a really interesting, but yeah, and, and it's very confusing. So, so you, you, you keep saying that you know, machine learning is too smart, right? and probably can be overestimate your, your what you can do. And then, this is it is just a reason, a particular reason that your, your, this method, this interesting method, can, can combine with the, with the machine learning on, on top of that and then make a following improvement. Yeah, so, so historically it started from those uh, standard diamond invariant mass. That was a typical way of uh, discovering Higgs to diamion. As I told you this uh, uh, initial, so, so this analysis, I, I think this they also use the part of machine learning, but you, you see that they just use 7% uh, of the cross section to uh, discover the signal and eliminate all these 90% because there is a serious background in it. And in order to distinguish the background, you have to distinguish quark and gluon uh, initial state radiation very well. And in order to do that, you need a, a deep learning technique. To, and for before using that deep learning technique, the standard analysis is uh, giving a cut for invariant mass and PT and the standard analysis uh, made by colliders. But combining with the uh, deep learning, basically you are screwed up because uh, uh, you need it for quark gluon jet discrimination, but they also affect this invariant mass and then uh, people screwed up. And now I suggest that there is a way uh, for machine not to learn the parts that you don't want to learn. And then uh, we just use those improvements made by the machine on jet substructure and add them into the standard analysis of the invariant mass and complete the analysis. That was. May I then, because of your machine learning, which requires uh, some, some pre selection of the event. Uh, oh, no, no, no. It's, 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 not, it's not pre selection. Basically, machine can explore all the parameter spaces, but the imposing this uh, mutual information is uh, also uh, added to the loss function. And then I always require mutual information with the invariant mass to be zero. And then they don't explore the direction of the mutual information and only explore the orthogonal directions, which include the jet substructure. So I just ask uh, them to do what I want. Yeah. Thank you.